person. I mean, he's he's a contradiction. He's a walking contradiction. You can't pin that guy down, right? Like, what is he, half Jewish, half English, gay, uh, Catholic. provocateur, Catholic, who's, a, who's, who's really... Who's re yeah, who loves black guys and who who and who, who is it, who appeals to American Republicans? It's like, what are you going to say about something somebody like that? It's like he's a he's a he's a trickster figure, archetypally speaking, you know, and he's he's a provocateur and a comedian. And the funny thing about comedians, they're like jesters in the king's court. The jester was the only person who could tell the truth because he was beneath contempt. And that's the role that comedians and provocateurs play. They're poking, they're poking and laughing and, and making fun. And, you know, Milo, Christ, he even dresses like a, a, what do you call those, a harlequin. You know, he's a trickster. And trickster figures emerge in times of crisis. And they point out what no one wants to see. And they say things that no one will say. And you can say all the terrible things about him. He is a provocateur. He's an egomaniac. He's a, he, I don't think he's narcissistic, but because he has some real capacity for self-reflection. But, um, and he's brave as can be, I mean, and, and he's unstoppable on his feet. He just amazes me. I've never seen anyone ever, I don't think, and I've met some pretty damn smart people, I've never seen anyone who can take on an onslaught of criticism and reverse it like he can. It's bloody amazing. But he is all those things you described, but, you know, the times call forth the, the speakers and We've called forth Milo. And that, <laughs> yeah, well, and that tells you what our times are. So M Milo's been on my show, and he's supposed to come again soon. Uh, he's, a, he's exactly the things that Jordan said. Uh, at times, he, he has an ability to depart from truth. He was speaking <laughs> right. So, for example, when he says things like, there is no such thing as lesbians. Uh, well, I, I appreciate his provocateur nature, but then it, it'd be nice to stay closer to the truth. But to the extent that he is getting a lot of young people engaged, probably more than Jordan and I could, uh, you know, in, in our lifetimes, a lot of people are associating to him. And so his central message is truly important. So even if once in a while he makes a departure from truth, uh, I'll grant him that because his greater... Uh, his own death is quite important, so I certainly support him. Jordan Peterson is getting the Milo treatment. Maybe by now you've seen that amazing car crash interview on Channel 4, and if you haven't, um, watch the end of this, and then immediately go to YouTube and find the 27 or the 29-minute version, because it's amazing. Now, Jordan Peterson is able to do what most of us only dream about, which is, and I've done it myself in interviews on occasion, but I don't always get it right. I have been on... Channel 4 with Kathy Newman, who is a sort of hyper, hyper, hyper feminist uh, British presenter. And she asked me some of the same questions with some of the same interview technique. Now, what Kathy Newman does, and I don't know because I haven't worked out whether this is all part of a clever strategy to get right wingers to say weird and wacky and outrageous things. But what she'll do is she'll listen to a nuanced and complex answer to a contentious and emotionally charged subject. Let's say the wage gap or campus rape culture, and she'll listen for sort of trigger words, and then she'll restate the, the she'll, she, it's not even restating your argument. What she does is she uses a few words to construct an outrageous, so what you're saying is X statement, which is, has no relation whatsoever to what your original claim was. So you might say something like, well, if you perform a multivariate analysis, you discover actually that the, you know, the wage gap is there for a variety of reasons, not just sex and certainly not just discrimination, but women's choices, different educational choices, women's priorities. And, and, so, and, she'll, and so she'll she'll cut you off and respond something like, so what you're saying is there's no point uh, trying to fight for equality because it's never going to happen and women should just get used to uh, not being equal. And it's very difficult to respond to that kind of interviewing. And it's, I don't know whether that's a result of... of She's either brilliant or actually her IQ is 75. Either way, it's, it's, it's effective when you're interviewing um, uh, right-wingers. because she, or Well, anyone, really, because she's able to caricature your position in the most grotesque terms in a very aggressive way that is designed to kind of get under people's skin. Now, Jordan Peterson gave a half-an-hour interview about a variety of different things. He has a new book coming out, um, his his guide to life or 12 steps to happiness or whatever it is um he's got a new book coming out he's talking about the wage gap he's talking about you know equality all kinds of things like that and she's throwing these weird crazy they're not they're not summaries of his positions because they're, they're actually in many cases the opposite of what he believes she's listening for the for keywords or terms and throwing out aggressive 
baseless questions designed to make him sound nuts. So she's asking, so you believe this? No, I never said that. Here's what I believe. So you believe this? No, I never said that. And this goes on for about half an hour, and it's absolutely gripping if you're really into this kind of stuff like I am. And if you're not, it's actually very bad television, but it it demonstrates one of the strategies that they use to interview um, those of us who understand that not everything is really super simple, and you can't just say... Um, oh, there's a wage gap of 9%, the world must stop turning until we fix it. it. Those of us who want to talk about equality of outcome versus equality of opportunity, women's different educational choices, yada, yada, yada. Um, there's sort of subtlety and complexity that modern feminism does not permit, and certainly feminism on television doesn't get, let you get away with. This is the stuff that um, can get people into trouble. Anyway, look, so... <laughs> This interview, grueling, half an hour viewing, it's either great television or a brilliant evisceration, a car crash for her, depending on your pr perspective. But what happened afterwards was even more telling, even more telling than her interview technique. So it's a perfect lesson, by the way. This is, and, and this is a per I'm, I'm going to talk to you later in the show about how this stuff works and why they do this. But I want to draw your attention to a Twitter thread from um, a user called Cheeky Scrump, uh, who gets it exactly right. And I'm going to read you out what he said. He said, Kathy Newman got crushed on broadcast TV, and they reframe, they're reframing her being laughed at as vicious, misogynistic abuse. That's not abuse from Peterson, but that's abuse from the comment section afterwards. People basically saying, ha ha, you got owned, or whatever, or, you know, whatever it is, wrecked. Um, this is, this is um, we're going to talk in a minute about what exactly that abuse really looks like versus how it's reported in the press. Uh, but this user, Cheeky Scrum, I don't know who he is. He seems to be like a, a Dungeons & Dragons fan who also has great insight into gender politics. Um, must be a Gamergate guy. Uh, this is how the media will go after Peterson. You can bet your ass they'll never allow him on TV again because he destroyed them. The Guardian, doing stellar propaganda work as always, is saying Jordan Peterson has a large following in the, quote, alt-right, end quote, who, f uh, who fucking hate and mock him. Let me spell out exactly how this is going to go, says the user on Twitter. I'm going to read to you a page of his. This is because what he's done is he's seen it happen to me and now he's seen it happen to Jordan Peterson. And now he's created this roadmap. Um, and it's it's the neatest explanation of this that I've ever seen, including in my own columns. So I'm going to read the whole thing to you. Um, Channel 4 and Kathy Newman know they got obliterated in that debate and they aren't happy with their narrative being destroyed. There's going to be a media campaign to prevent this happening again. Step one, which is where we are now, change the conversation from the loss of the debate to vile online abuse, having uh, the debate, the, the, excuse me, the vile online abuse that the debate has caused. Channel 4 are making a big show of this, hiring a security agent. They were very public about the fact they'd have to hire a security agent for Kathy Newman, but they're showing no evidence of the threats. Step one, part two, we're still here. The, um, the articles that are coming out about it, this huge media furore about the supposedly misogynistic abuse that the presenter is getting, Allow the media to frame Jordan Peterson as being transphobic or, or hateful or whatever, and they, and they help lies like him being alt-right because they'll try to associate the worst of what's happening on the internet with him just because like, cause we're all, of course, totally responsible for everything that all of our fans say at all times. Um, this removes people from the primary source video and controls the narrative about what Jordan Peterson believes. So what they're doing is they're saying, well, because... Jordan Peterson is surrounded by a load of harassers and abusers and threateners on the internet. That's what he believes too. He's just as bad as all of them now. Issues and suicide are so high amongst young men, particularly in Western mm. societies. Um, Jordan, Jordan Peterson, I noticed, I, I don't think it was a, I, it'd be wrong to characterize it as a flinch, but a reaction when Louise was talking. You've written this as well. If men are pushed too hard to feminize, they will become more and more interested in harsh fascist political ideology. That seemed to me an odd thing to say. Um, it's I a mean, standard Louise, Louise psychoanalytic Louise idea. It's it's not it, it's not a harsh thing to say at all. If you deny people's essential nature, competitive nature, for example, isn't it the classic going to be a kickback? And isn't to it, think it, of that as enculturated purely as just incorrect? Yes, but isn't it the classic abuser's exculpation? Uh, it's a it's a withdrawal from responsibility. Um, you pushed me to it. You made me hit you. It's, it's not a justification. It's, it's yeah. just an observation of what's likely. If you if you push people too far in a particular direction, it's a warning, not a justification. But the solution to that is not to worry about feminizing men. It's perhaps to worry about men joining fascist organizations. No, I think it's to worry about the sorts of things that Lawrence already, already talked about and the probability that um, like steep, unequal hierarchies will produce desperate 
young men. And that's actually a critique of hierarchy, by the way. I, Louise O'Neill. Yeah, I just I have two points there. I suppose the first one is is that when you talk about, you know, feminizing men, it almost sounds derogatory. It's almost as if you're saying that to be feminine or to express any sort of femininity is actually inferior to masculinity. Um, and I think that is a huge problem even with within the language that we use. You know, when you say, don't be such a girl, don't be such a pussy, the, the gracious insults that men can give each other tend to have feminine or origins, like, you know, as I said, pussy or faggot um, or anything like that. And I think, again, that speaks to... Um, a very systematic um, inequality uh, between the genders. Um, and, yeah, and you attributed the, the, the uh, rates of mental illness among men to... Not when you're talking about a, a, a transformation in behavior that that's, that's that profound. I mean, we don't know how men and women can work properly together in the workforce. It's very complicated. But men do. don't know how to compete you know, millions with of women. men and women across the world go to yeah, work you together have, day but, in, well, day out. You, but you're the one so, who asked about Me you're Too. The one me who, too don't is, start with you're the one who. Me Too is a, well, Me Too is an expression of the fact that men and women are having a hard time regulating their behavior in the workplace. That's the only reason I responded to that, because the question well, was I think posed. you're more broadly suggesting that, that, that some men are having a grave problem with it. What is the lesson of the Harvey Weinstein story for you? Someone should have said something about Harvey Weinstein much sooner. But we could start somewhere else. We could start with Harvey Weinstein was wrong to do what he did before we get yes, around well, I, to yes, yes. Other, other people should have spoken look, out. It's fair, just, that's look, the secondary no, no, order issue. Fair enough, fair enough. I thought that went without saying. There are going to be psychopathic predators. They're going to exist. And what has to happen is that people have to stop them because they won't stop themselves. And so I thought that was sort of implicit in the statement. Obviously, he shouldn't have done what he did. But you don't think that the culture in which he was operating, that there was particularly... The, the, the proper ways of existing in the world start to shrink to a very, very small range, let's say. Um, I really like the developmental psychologist John Piaget. I've talked a fair bit about his ideas, and so some of you might have heard some of the things I've, I've said about Piaget before. But what I really like about Piaget, in part, is his analysis of children's games. Children's games are the microcosm of society, which is why children like games, because they have to learn how to act in society. So they generate toy societies, which is what you do when you play video games, or go see a movie, by the way. You generate a toy society, and then you practice acting in it. And the toy society has, it's, it's, it has the same structure as real society, except at lower resolution. And that's what children are doing. That's why you should leave them to have alone when they're playing, because they're actually practicing, learning how to exist. And so it isn't, it isn't trivial. The fact that they're enjoying it, it's beside the point. It's just that's an indication that they're following the instinctive path of meaning, let's say. And so they're practicing being in the world. And so it would be a good thing, for example, if our children, our schools, let children play a lot more than they do let them play. liability reasons, which is something that's happened almost everywhere, which is so appalling. It's almost unutterable. So, um, so children, so Piaget was very interested in what made a good game, and he, he laid out some rules. A good game is one that you can play iteratively, and that's a good thing to know if you're going to marry someone, because you're going to play the same game every day for like, <laughs> like 5,000 iterations, right? So, well, that's it. So, there's a little code that goes along with that, by the way, and it's something to think about, too, is you know, because a lot of people make the mistake of thinking that the exceptional things they do in their life, like the vacations they take and so forth, are the important things in their life. And that's just absolutely not true. The things you do every day are the important things. And so those money <laughs> things. I got a client, I'll get back to the game thing, but I had a client who, who was spending about 45 minutes, this is sort of related to rule of five, which I said I wasn't Talk about <laughs> don't, don't let your children do anything to make you dislike them. He, he was spending about 45 minutes a night fighting with his son to try to get him to go to bed. And so I knew that parents actually only spend on average about 20 minutes a day with their little kids, like in direct one on one contact. You know, they're around them, but direct one on one contact is in a small proportion of the time. And so you're spending 45 minutes a night fighting with your kid. Like that's twice as much time as you would normally spend with them. And if you think that that's going to end well, then you're not thinking about it. So we thought about it. People don't like it when I do this because people don't like arithmetic. But we did a little bit of arithmetic. So 
figure 45 minutes a day is about five hours a week, okay? and so that's about 20 hours a month, so that's half a work week a month, and so if you multiply that by 12, then that's six work weeks a year, a month and a half of work weeks. So basically, he was spending a month and a half of work weeks a year fighting with his son. It's like, that's not a good game, right? That's not a game anyone's going to win. And so, but, but it's interesting to do that arithmetic with regards to the things that you repeat every day, because you sort of learn exactly what your life is made of, and your life is made up of those things that you repeat. And so what you want to do is get those mundane things that you repeat pristine, which is why I've got that little trope that you were all laughing about about cleaning up your room. It's like, well, you live in the damn thing. It's like, why not put it in order? Maybe even go the next step and make it beautiful if you can manage that. And it's, well, it's just my room. It's like, well, that's one way of looking at it. Another way of looking at it is that it's, it's, a, it's the microcosm of being that you have at hand. And if it's a mess, then it's like, well, what the hell are you up to exactly? You can't even manage that. That's pretty pathetic. You know? And you think, well, you know, it's beneath me. Oh, really, is it? Okay, well, fine. You know? So if someone gives you a whole country to rule, well, you can pull off your socks and get your act together and nail that stuff. It's just, it's just your damn dream. Okay, so back, back to the game. What Piaget noted with children was that if you're going to set up a good game, then everybody has to want to play it. You have to be able to play it over and over, but everybody has to want to play That's the definition of a good game. It's, and it's so cool because he was, he was actually trying, Piaget was actually trying to reconcile the distinction between science and religion. That was what was driving him throughout his entire intellectual life. And he was trying to understand the, the evolution of morality. And one of his observations was, well, children spontaneously play, and their games tend towards playable games. And a playable game is one where everyone is treated with a certain amount of respect as a valid player, and everyone actually wants to play the game, so it's voluntary. And that's a really good definition of a free society. It's like, well, you, you, you get to play, and you get to play, and you both want to play, and if it's set up, you can't think of a better game, and so away you go. And so that's another indication of the fact that there's something about a fundamental ethic that isn't just arbitrary. And this is a very important thing to get right, I would say, in the 21st century, because one of the things that we kept claiming in the 20th century was that any old arbitrary game will do. They're all equally arbitrary. It doesn't matter if they're Marxist or capitalist. It's all equally arbitrary. It's like, no, that's wrong. That's seriously wrong. The, the scientific data are in, the philosophical data are in, the narrative is in. There's a very constrained number of ways that we can orient ourselves in the world, 